Hi guys, we're going to do a Photoshop review. We're going to cover everything we've gone through thus far and then introduce a couple of new tools for you guys to use. So I'm going to start by um, uploading an image or bringing an image into Photoshop. So you can either drag that in directly from your desktop or you can click open here and then find the file wherever it is on your computer. And now we've got an image. So I'm again, I'm just going to go through everything we've covered up until this point and just kind of show you guys my workflow in Photoshop um, in terms of making basic edits. So the first thing that we're going to do is change this image into 16 bits per channel. Again, that's just better quality for making edits to the uh, original image. Next, what I do is copy the background layer. Um, that just gives you a little bit of a safety net because you will start by making edits and layering them on top of the background layer. Um, if something goes wrong, you always have this background copy to go back to. So in Photoshop, uh, there's kind of two approaches to editing. Some uh, changes will be made to the actual pixels of the image. Others are just layers um, that kind of just that lay on top of the photograph and make those adjustments that way. So these things over here are your adjustment layers um, and these tools over here uh, edit the physical pixels of the image. So um, what I'm going to do from here is I'm going to turn the image into black and white and I'm going to show you guys two ways to go about doing this. So the first thing that I showed you or the first way I showed you was to come back up here to images go to adjustments and then come down here and select black and white. Um, either way you do it, it's going to present you with this little drop down menu. Um, so it opens to these default settings. You then can come in and adjust specific color channels. So uh, consider what the image looks like in color. And then if there's areas of that image or certain colors that you would like to either make more dramatic or less dramatic, you can go ahead and do that here. I'm going to basically leave this alone. I might I'll see what some of these do, but um, for the most part, I just leave these alone. Sometimes I'll use it to darken the sky a little bit, like I said, so I might darken that and potentially darken that. Maybe that did something. It darkened some of the shadow areas. So when you're happy with it, click like this. Um, next thing that I'm going to do is consider my composition. So this image is actually an image I took on a 35 millimeter film camera um, and then scanned it into my computer. So you can see some areas where the scan has just included like this black strip up here and then there's a lot of dust in this image as well. That's all this stuff sitting on top of the uh, image. And soon enough, you guys will be scanning in images beginning next semester in view camera, so you will be doing a lot of these things, so we might as well just get a head start on it. Um, alrighty, so next I'm gonna use the crop tool. I haven't shown you guys this yet, but it's fairly straightforward. It's right here. You'll select that. Um, if at any point you want to see your full frame image, sorry, uh, you can just click Command-0, and that's just gonna bring you back to this like full frame view. So for the crop tool, you can adjust these sides independently. You can also come up here and select a ratio. So if you're photographing, you know, say a medium format camera, you want all of your images to be square, you can still definitely crop all of your images down to a square format um, for this class. So you would select that. Um, original ratio is just the original size of the image. Um, or you can type in your own size. So you could say like 8, or sorry, um, eight by 10 or whatever. Um, again, I'm just gonna leave it at original ratio. I'm just gonna pull this down and crop out this line. Mm, may actually leave it here, clear. Then you can kind of set your own and move all of these independently, which is what I would like to do. Alrighty. Then you click the check mark when you're happy with it. Now we've got it um, cropped, it looks good, so uh, we're ready to move on. Um, so now I'm just gonna add some basic adjustment layers. Basically what I do from here is I make sure that my image has a black point as well as a white point. And there's a couple of different ways to do this. I'm just gonna show you guys what I believe to be basically the easiest method. So you're gonna open a levels layer. That is going to give you this histogram. And again, this is an adjustment layer, so it sits on top of the background copy as opposed to um, other tools that actually uh, affect the pixels of the image. 
So we are have our levels layer open. We're looking at a histogram right here. Um, basically what this histogram is, is it's showing you all of the different ranges of tones in your image, this being your white point, and this being your black point, and these being your mid-tones. So um, my histogram looks pretty good. Things you wanna look for is this edge here coming down too sharply and not extending to the full range. Basically what that's telling you is um, that your the dark tones or the shadows in your image are not actually achieving a full uh, true black. And it's nice to have this kind of slope in your histogram like so. That's basically showing you that just a really small portion of the image is actually coming in as true black, which is what we want. If I were to scoot this over, you'll notice that my image is going to get darker, or rather my dark areas are going to get darker like so, and basically that's just moving my black point to include more of the tones present in the image. But we just want like the, again, we, you know, you want true black, but you just want it to reach that true black and then go back into the detail. Um, you can move your mid-tones around to your liking. I generally don't do a lot. If anything, I'll come in and kind of darken mid-tones, but that really is just dependent on the image. And then the same thing over here, this is showing you your white point. So if your histogram falls short here, it means that you aren't reaching like a true white point in your images. So if that happens, you're just gonna wanna grab onto this little triangle and you're just going to move it over until it reaches the end of your histogram. Again, mine is, my histogram is coming all the way to the end. So that's alerting me that the, there are tones in this image that are true white. And I assume that they are these kind of highlights up here in the cloud. Now there's another way to uh, kind of see what's happening in your image in terms of uh, black points and white points and sometimes I do this method as well so you're gonna uh, click on this icon down here and you're going to select threshold that's just gonna quickly open an adjustment layer and basically what this does is it brings up another histogram um, but it allows you to slide your uh, dial all the way over here when you go all the way to the left it's going to show you what areas of your image are coming in as actually black so again when you scoot this all the way over to the end ideally you're just going to see a few um, kind of areas of your image coming in in true black now again this is dependent on the image so if you're taking images at night where a lot of the image is just dark then you'll have a lot more um, of this area that's coming in as true black um, so what you can do from here is you can zoom in on the area to get kind of a better look and to get closer and you'll notice how it comes into a little bit uh, better focus. Then what you can do is come over here, you're gonna select the eyedropper tool, you're gonna hold down and you're going to hover over the color sampler tool. Select that. Now you're gonna come in here and you're just going to select one of these areas that's coming in as true black. So it doesn't matter too much as long as the tip of the eyedropper is over something that is 100% black. So I'm gonna place it there. Now I've basically just put down like an indicator, like a little target of where I made that selection. Now you're just gonna simply come over here, delete your threshold layer, like so. You're gonna open another levels layer. You are going to come over here. You have three dro eyedroppers here, black point, mid-tones, and your white point. You're gonna select the black point because that's what we just identified. You'll come over here and you will uh, place this over the center of that target and you'll click. Now ideally you won't see a whole lot of change uh, depending on the range in the image. So basically what I've done is I have just um, set my black point to that. So you can see I could mess around and kind of click here. And now what I've done, I just clicked somewhere random down here in the middle of the canyon. Basically what it does is it just makes that part of the image true black. So you can do it, you know, I could click here. Obviously that's not what I want because I just clicked on a highlight. Um, but that's basically how this tool functions. So again, I'm going to come back here to this area that I determined to be true black with my threshold layer. And I'll click there. And you can repeat that process for your highlight, and then you'll just use that white dropper here to make sure that your highlights are coming across the way that you would like them to. Um, alrighty, great. So now I've basically got two levels layers that are, are doing really the same thing. Another uh, tool to know how to use, or just a little quick tip, you can click these eye logos, icons, whatever, right here, and that will either um, like erase that layer from view or bring it back into view. So we can see as I click uh, the eye here, there's a slight change in the image, um, nothing too crazy. So I am going to delete this levels layer and leave the other one, just because they're basically doing the same function for me and I like the look of this one. Okay, so uh, 
Other adjustment layers I showed you how to use, this brightness and contrast. Um, you can also turn the image into black and white with a levels layer. So you can select this, it'll open that same menu we saw before. Um, and this way, you actually have that as a, uh, as a layer as opposed to something that is just in the actual image now. Uh, that's really your choice. This is kind of nice because you can turn it on and off. Um, or you can come back in and make changes to those settings that you had the option to do in the first place where you don't have the ability to go back and change those settings if you change the image to black and white accessing it through this manner. Okay, great. So I don't need that black and white layer because it's already changed black and white in my background copy. Um, okay, so and then other tools we went through are using the spot healing brush. So again, that lives here. The dodging and burning tool is down here. You'll hover out over, over it and you can select either one of those. Um, spot healing brush. Actually, this image is a, a good image to use this. Again, all of this dust here can be removed using the spot healing brush. So I'm zooming in. I've got the spot healing brush selected. I've got content aware selected up here. Uh, the hardness is fairly soft. I like that, but I might increase it a bit and great. So I'm gonna make my brush size a little bit smaller. It's always best to just work in smaller bites with this tool. Uh, you just wanna be able to cover the area that you're using. And consider this to be like spot pens. That's you know the, where it came from, uh, where the name came from. So you don't want to uh, be click and drag to make these edits. You want to just click and then click again. So it's not letting me make these edits right now because I have this levels layer selected. You're just gonna wanna select the background copy. Boom. So that worked okay, but it didn't really cover that entire piece of dust. So I'm gonna do Control Z. I'm gonna make my tool a little bigger and try again. Okay, that was better. And then you can just come in and yeah, make these edits. It's very fun. It takes a very long time, um, but it really makes the difference, especially when you start to make digital prints. So you'll just go through and do all of that. I'll show you guys how I'll handle a, a slightly trickier area. Um, cause this can be, yeah, just a little bit more tricky. Okay. So I'll come through like, so again with this, you don't want to come through and do that cause it will confuse. Wow. That actually worked pretty well. Photos really, <laughs> Photoshop's really stepping up its game. Uh, generally you don't want to do that. You can kind of see how it, it didn't handle this like uh, transition area very well right there. So what I would do in that scenario is I would find part of my image that kind of mimics that area considering what the background color looks like and what the foreground color looks like. I'm kind of thinking that this would work pretty well. We'll see what happens. Either way, I'm gonna come over here, use the healing brush, come back to that area, I'm gonna make my tool a little bigger. I'm gonna click the option key, select, and then I'm gonna drag that up here. It should give me a little preview. There we go. Oh, that wasn't actually a very good selection. Sorry, my computer's going slow. But either way, if you liked it, you could select and then it would paste. See, it looks all right, but, um, well, actually, yeah. Heck, it looks fine. And when you zoom out, I mean, I was working on this little teeny area of the image, so really, who can say? No one. Um, but if you're a perfectionist like me, you'll really get into all of the details of your image. Alrighty, so um, now that we've gone over all of that, I'm gonna introduce our next tool, which is going to be using smart objects. This is a really helpful thing to start using. Um, it's really important. I didn't use them for a long time, and I think my my editing workflow was not as smooth or it was more labor intensive because I wasn't using smart objects. So you should just start using them right off the bat. Uh, how smart objects are going to work, um, they are basically something you can do to this background layer. You'll click, I just, to access that, I right clicked on my trackpad. This menu will pop up and you'll click convert to smart object. You can also access that, it's loading. Sorry. There we go. You can also do that by clicking these three lines here and that same menu will pop up. Okay, so now it's a smart object. Now what I can do is I can make edits to the actual image and it'll allow me the option to come back in and remove those edits if I'm not happy with them. So for example, um, something that I could do is I could add a filter to the image. Now ordinarily when you add a filter to an image, um, it will just, kind when you click okay, it will just 
there'll be no layer mask. It will just be in this background copy layer and you won't be able to access it and change uh, what you've already done. But if you turn it into a smart object, you will be able to access it again. So what I'm gonna do is just add, um, just add like a fun little lens flare situation in this image. So there's a, obviously a ton of things in Photoshop that you can mess around with. You know, feel free to do that whenever you want. I'm just gonna add this just to kind of show you guys how to use smart objects. So click OK. I've added it to the image. Fun little sun flare there. Um, now what is actually important about that was what it has done here to my background copy. So it can we can see here how it says smart filters. Then it has this lens flare underneath. So now I can double click that and it's going to reopen up this uh, window and I can go ahead and like make changes to that if I'd like to um, or whatever. So. That is how uh, you would go about using a smart object. Um, it will not have effect on adding a layer mask. So if I were to still add a layer mask, it's just gonna pop up as normal above. Uh, and the reason being is that you don't need that same capability to go in and edit those layer masks because it already gives you the ability to do that up here. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about are, uh, the, is the quick selection tool. So for the quick selection tool, you'll have to have your background copy selected. Um, okay, I don't want that. Quick selection tool lives right here. So um, you're gonna select this. It might have one of these other options selected right now, so you might not be able to see the icon. So if you have the magic wand tool open or the object selection tool or whatever, uh, you'll just click and hold down and you'll be able to open that. So now I've got this tiny little tool here. You can hardly see it, but again, you're just gonna use your brackets to change the size of this tool. So uh, now what I'm going to do is use this tool to make a selection of um, part of this image that I would like to edit independently from the rest of the image. So you can uh, make this selection and then add like a brightness layer to it or a levels layer so that you can change the way that this specific part of the image looks. Now the first thing I'm gonna do is turn off this lens flare because it's kind of annoying and I can't see what I'm trying to do. Okay, so I've come in here, I've got my tool. You'll notice that there's a little plus sign in the middle of this circle. Um, that means that it's grabbing information. So you'll see how it kind of makes its best guess to come through here and grab like the size of these rocks. This tool is pretty good. Sometimes you have to come in and help it. Um, but it works pretty good for the most part. So you can zoom in and make your tool smaller to handle these like little areas. And as long as that plus is in the middle of the circle, you will be grabbing information. Now say you accidentally overdid it like that and you'd rather have your mask um, cut right here, you'll hold the option key down. That will change that plus to a minus and then you can come in and um, place the mask where you would like it. Making sure to absolve any, uh, this is called marching ants, this pattern, any little areas of marching ants inside of or outside of your mask. Okay. Now I've done like a pretty bad job making that selection, but I don't need to make it perfect just for the demo. Okay, so I'll come in here because that will just bother me. Sorry guys, I did not have options selected. So you'll have to hold down option to make your mask smaller like so. Okay. And what I mean by coming in and removing all those marching ants is like here. So all of that will end up in your final mask. So you just want that to go in. Okay, beautiful. Now what you can do is select a mask. So there's a couple of ways to do this. I do it by holding down this icon here that will present you with this menu again and you've got all of your adjustment layers here. So I'm gonna add, say, an exposure layer. So now it's opened this window for me which is my exposure adjustment layer and then I can control this so I can reduce exposure and you'll see how it only affects the area that my mask has told me to. So, if anything, I might want to make the background a, a hair lighter? I don't know, maybe something like that. Looks fine. Um, what you can also do is select either or. So you can double click this 
um, enter and select mask. That's what I would like. And then you can come in and make some changes to the layer mask that you made. So you can uh, feather the edge a little, you can adjust transparency, all that good stuff. Or you can double click here and again that will reopen that exposure box. So that is how to make a layer mask. Um, yeah, that's okay. Cool, those are the three things I wanted to talk about in this video. Sorry, I want to talk about smart objects, quick selection tool, and layer masks. So I feel I've done that. Um, now that I'm at the end, I've made all my edits. I love the way my image looks. I will turn on my sun flare again just for fun. Um, now you're going to go ahead and save the image. Don't worry too much about that area, that little guy down there. That won't save into the final image. Okay, so now that I'm done with my image, I'm happy with the way it looks, um, I'm going to go ahead and save it. So again, um, when you save your image, you have a lot of options about file compression. So you'll go file, save as, I would like to save onto my computer, then it'll prompt you with this uh, page. So file format is what you want to note. There's the Photoshop file format that changes it to .psd, and then the TIFF file format. I always save as TIFFs because it's more universally friendly. More computers can open a TIFF than a PSD. Then you'll change the file name. Um, Project 3, there you go. So you'll wanna save it as either a TIFF or a Photoshop file um, to save your layers. So when you save an image as a JPEG, it compresses all of these layers down into the background layer. And then when you go to reopen the image, you will not be able to access these layers. You won't be able to make any of those changes. I wouldn't be able to get rid of that lens flare if I decided I hated it the next time I opened the image, uh, which I probably would. So it's always best to save your images as a TIFF or a PSD first. So I'll go ahead and do that. It's going to ask you about image compression. Again, you just want to have it say none, and then you don't really need to worry about the rest of those settings. It will tell you it'll increase file size. Yes, I would like that. And then it's saving, and you can watch it save down here. Great. Now you'll go ahead and do save as, save to your computer, and all you're going to do is you're going to change it to a JPEG, and you'll just save it to the same location. Boom, there you go. Now you've got one copy to upload to Box and one copy for you to keep so that you can reopen this image and make continuing edits um, if you would like to. Say for example, in, the, in Critique I tell you that the contrast is too high or whatever, you can come back in and just really easily lower the contrast as opposed to having to kind of start over from the beginning. So um, now that we've gone through that, I just wanna very quickly show you guys an opportunity to watch more Photoshop tutorials. If you already know everything that I've talked about, I, you know, I'm starting obviously at the very beginning Beginning of Photoshop so if you would like to learn more or if you prefer Lightroom you can um, follow these this path to a website called LinkedIn learning that again MSU has like a partnership with so you guys have access to this for free so all I've done is typed in LinkedIn learning here on montana.edu follow this link it used to be called lynda.com so that's why it says that you'll click this link net ID and password Then it will want you to um, like set up an account with your act like with LinkedIn. You can click, you can opt out of that. It'll then make you like pick a pick interests or whatever. Either way, once you get through all that and you find this, you can type in Photoshop tutorials. They have all of the different versions. So if you have Photoshop Shop CC or CS6 or whatever, you can search for specifically that, or you can come here um, and click through some of these videos and so they have like essential training basic this is obviously quite long but you can stop it and start it and like search for specific things within that um, and when you click on one of these there will be sub chapters within Photoshop is the industry standard you can come through and like click um, something more specific and it'll jump to that point in the video so you don't have to watch all six hours to get through to something that you are actually interested in. So they've got, you know, all sorts of things here, more into layers if you would like to work more with that, more into working with layer masks. I just showed you guys basically the, the bare minimum for that. So there's a lot more to learn there if you would like to. So feel free to access this if you would like to go more in depth into Photoshop or if you would like to use Lightroom instead. Alrighty, thanks guys.